Welcome and thanks to all of you who have gathered with us online today. My name is Maria Yablonina. I'm an assistant professor here at the Daniels faculty, and I'm delighted and very excited to welcome you all to Robots as Companions with our incredible guests, Su Gwen Chung and Madeline Gannon. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This evening's event, Robots as Companions, invites two artists and researchers whose practices examine, re-examine, and reimagine possible futures of our relationships with machines, robots, and technology in general. Um, I'm personally extremely happy and honored to be able to host this event today. Um, frankly, both Su Gwen and Madeline are my personal heroes for the longest time, and I'm so excited for the conversation that we're going to have today. Without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our artists, after which they will both um, give a short, roughly 15 minute presentation of their work, and then we will move on to the discussion part of the event. Su Gwen Chung is a Chinese born Canadian raised artist whose work explores the mark made by hand and the mark made by machine as an approach to understanding the dynamic dynamics of humans and systems. Her speculative critical practice spans performance, installation, and drawing, and has been featured in numerous exhibitions at museums and galleries around the world. Madeline Gannon, who will be presenting second after Su Gwen is done with her presentation, is a multidisciplinary designer inventing better ways to communicate with machines. In her research, she seeks to blend knowledge from design, robotics, and human computer interaction to innovate at the intersection of art and technology. Her recent work, uh, Taming Giant Industrial Robots, focuses on developing new frontiers in robot-human relations and relationships and co-living with humans as well as with robots. Um, thank you so much again for being here, Su Gwen and Madeline, and I will pass the microphone on to Su Gwen, and then I will re-emerge afterwards. Great, thank you, Maria. Uh... As, as you know, when um, you invited me to do this talk, I was pretty much like, yes, anything. <laughs> I'm very uh, honored to be speaking with you guys today and uh, presenting for uh, my hometown, actually, which is a rare treat. So I'll just get right into it and um, do this. So I'm actually uh, beaming in from London today, uh, but my name is Hugo Chung. I am a artist and researcher um, working in the intersection of um, art and robotics and technology. Thank you again to Maria and Madeline and um, Tim and the Daniels faculty for the invitation. Um, so in my work, I think a lot about um, robotics and AI and technology and these intersections between um, you know, ro robotics and technology and the human. And as we know, even something like artificial intelligence has come to describe an increasingly interwoven suite of technologies, including robotics, machine learning, synthetic sensing and natural language processing. Um, and I think growing up as a musician and programmer, I thought of machines um, and the technologies that drive them as perfect tools that could make my work more efficient and productive. But um, as, I've, as we've seen in industries increasingly automate human work with machines, it really led me to wonder, machines are starting to do the work traditionally done by humans, what becomes of the human hand and how does this drive towards perfection, precision and automation affect our ability to be creative? Um, the truth is this encounter of the human and machine artifact exists in so many different configurations, forms and loops and relations and um, it really drives my um, sort of unbridled curiosity to explore, uncover, and unbend some of these um, possibilities. Um, and I think this really implicates the fields of art and design technology um, and all these different interdisciplinary fields. Um, and, and I'm sort of bringing in, just because it's this talk's called Robot and Companions, I think there's a lot of ways um, that these configurations, these um, narratives and uh, robotics and technology, um, I, I think there's some that do kind of harm in the world. And I think this uh, trend towards uh, this type of uh, anthropomorphism 
um, in Sophia the robot and Ada. Um, I've encountered a lot in my in my travels, um, and I I find the idea of a female created uh, uh, representation of a robot in a white dress designed by a team of men a little bit um, uh, strange. <laughs> uh, you can look that up. And also these other configurations um, that uh, sort of um, speak to this machine as control mechanism um, in this sort of matrix ripoff dystopian future, not as um, uh, compelling. Um, also thinking about um, narratives in AI that um, use AI systems to erase uh, the work of female painters as a, uh, as a narrative is a bit, um, uh, I wouldn't say a point of inspiration for me, but something I'm uh, definitely uh, positioned um, um, away from um, and will really love discussions around uh, what these narratives, uh, narratives around robotics um, do in that way. But uh, in my work as an artist and researcher, I think I'm really trying to invent new types of relations um, with these tools um, and interested in the role of art practice in shaping the cultural imagination about technology and what we think of as human and machine. And it's really been part of this lifelong fascination, um, like Maria said, with the dynamics between individuals and systems um, and exploring where AI ends and we begin um, and thinking about it as where art and research intersect. Um, and doing this work has taught me um, of many things, actually, I'm really honored to be able to share some of it. Um, it's taught me how artistic practice can really offer a new beginning for scientific research. Um, and by combining uh, AI and robotics with traditional forms of creativity, visual arts, in my case, allows us to discover new uh, fields of research inquiry. Um, and it's taught me that it's not human versus machine, but human and machine. By recognizing the strengths and weaknesses of human and machine systems and being really brazen and bold about what those are, we can move forward in a new direction, chartering, uh, charting sensory mixes of the future, new sensory mixes of the future. Um, and, you know, it's also taught me that um, AI uh, and robotics, um, but AI in, in this sort of lens doesn't come from this, uh, its, its own source. It really is a reflection of ourselves, our societies, our mirror of our hopes and biases. Um, and in this way, um, in this context taught me how collaboration, um, not automation or replication um, is the key to creating space for both human machine as we both move forward. Um, this is a much longer talk I'm adapting, so I'm hoping to not um, run out of time, but I'm just going to continue on. Um, so, and, uh, you know, I'm going to share a little bit about where I've been and where I'm going with the work, um, working since 2014 on drawing operations and now moving towards forward-rearing agricultural network and some other multi-generational projects. But to start, um, I've been working on a multi-generational drawing project. Um, it's actually now in its fifth generation, uh, but this is outlining a little bit of one, two, and three. Um, I called the project Doug for short. Drawing with Doug was uh, too good of a hashtag to resist. Um, I started generation one with uh, a really simple exploration into mimicry uh, and thinking about a duet as a mirroring of positional data captured through a really simple computer vision algorithm and color tracking. Um, where uh, both uh, drawers, um, machine and human, oh, there was a video there, um, but you'll have to find it online, um, uh, mirrored uh, similar positions in real time. And, um, and it really uh, made me think of how artistic production can operate as a microcosm for how tools are deployed in the real world through this performance piece um, the errors of the system added to the uh, visual richness of the work and um, really uh, taught me at the time a lot about the, the value of the embodiment of, um, of, of machine uh, transition and what that could do for a practice. Um, I really pushed my drawing as well. So it made me think about uh, self-reinforcing technologies versus self-limiting technologies. Um, um, and uh, when I, when I talk about that, I mean, um, I really appreciated that 
uh, instead of enforcing the system and atrophying my um, drawing ability, this um, through working with this really simple drawing system, how uh, sort of taught me a little bit um, about this existing behavior, um, and and I liked that um, um, they it was sort of a self limiting technology in that, that it didn't impose um, upon my uh, you know drawing sensibility for generation two. Um, I trained a recurrent neural network on two decades of my drawing data to deliberately create a system that could respond to my drawing in ways that I didn't expect. So I would input a line and the recurrent neural network based on my decades of drawing would respond um, in a sort of uh, in my style based on the input inputted data that I um, sort of fed it over uh, quite a few years. And I'm constantly training the system to uh, uh, just continue to evolve with um, my drawing style as it evolved. Um, and I learned many things uh, through that project, but one of them um, was not only that it would be interesting to think about uh, a small data set as artistic, um, um, you know, drawing and data, but that um, the training an AI system is actually a lot of hard work. And I really recognize the um, the amount of invisible labor behind the scenes um, and uh, explore how the architecture of um, AI and this recurrent neural network was uh, constructed. And I discovered that it wasn't just made of models and classifiers in a neural network, but that it was a system that is fundamentally malleable and shapeable and one in which the human hand is always present. And um, it made me, made me think about how embodied AI could mark the beginning of uh, developing a kind of networked instinct. There's a lot of different ways to parse, um, um, you know, and just to, to learn physically these systems um, in a way that goes beyond just um, observing a simulation on screen. Uh, and I could talk a lot more about that, but I'm, I'm almost on time, so I'm gonna continue. Um, and in this process thought about how um, machine systems uh, as an ab abstraction of human intent can catalyze new forms of thinking and knowing. Um, I'm gonna skim uh, through some of this, but thinking about etymological origins of um, the language we use for describing these technologies. Um, in English, the uh, computer translates to a computational system meant to produce automation and then becoming a little bit more inspired by my um, uh, the Chinese origins of computer for me, which translates uh, directly to a uh, the no electric brain. So again, thinking about different culturally situated perspectives that can inform the invention of new um, technologies um, inspired by the work of Harold Cohen, uh, but also thinking about ways to create uh, systems of interdependence and not codependence as in um, I'm we're drawing uh, together and not um, and not really uh, I don't lose my drawing ability through working uh, this way. Uh, I think I'm running up on time, so I'm just going to talk through a little bit more. Um, drawing operations unit generation three was a multi robotic system trained on um, actually uh, positional data from uh, crowds extracted from public cameras in New York City. Um, sort of breaking the binary from human and machine to um, human and uh, networked robotic system, uh, really thinking about how these systems view a crowd. Um, and it's been uh, a real uh, journey working even with just three of these generations. I'm um, on generation five, which is focusing on uh, relational robotics and uh, bringing in uh, my own EEG data through meditation. Um, into uh, into the space of collaboration. And hopefully I'll be able to share some of that um, while uh, we're in discussion uh, with Madeline and Maria. Um, and with that, I will hand that off to um, Madeline. Thanks. Super inspiring. Uh the same. Like, I'm so I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm so happy to be here, Maria and Suguan. Your work is equally inspiring to me, and and um, and just just the way what, what's so exciting about this to me is just that the three of us and a collection of other people are 
grabbing a hold of a topic and exploring in such different directions, putting pushing on edges in, in towards different frontiers. And it's it's very rewarding to be able to 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 have our own little areas of inquiry, uh, have our own little pockets of interest, and to be able to champion each other and and rally on each other um, whenever whenever we're doing great things. So I'm I'm super excited to be here. Uh, let me kick over to my keynote. Um, so. I just want to really show uh, a couple of projects of mine that have to do with robotics. Uh, this is really just to get a flavor, some context of what we're going to talk about, where I'm coming from, and um, just be able to to kick off the conversation. So for me, I work a lot with industrial robots, and instead of approaching it from the standpoint of automation, I usually come at it from the perspective of interaction. Uh, my background is in architecture. I'm kind of obsessed with how the body moves through space. And when I was able to learn how to program and, and talk to a machine, I was able, also able to give it those same sensibilities. And that's kind of the line of inquiry that I tease on. And so uh, if you don't know, there's this amazing point in time where the very beginning of modern robotics in industry, in the very beginning of robotics and kinetic, mechanical kinetic sculpture in art coincided. So this is Unimate uh, in the, the early 70s, the first industrial robot onto a car factory line, and this kinetic sculpture uh, by Dutch artist Edward Inokwix, sorry for the pronunciation, um, was like really looking at this mechanical creature. And I sort of see this as like two timelines in our universe. And the timeline that we're on is where the economics of robots for their efficiency, optimization, and repetition won out over robots for their curiosity, companionship, and care. And in my work, what I like to do is to sort of imagine that we went down the other timeline. What would our life be like today if for the past 50 years, these machines were more about curiosity, companionship, and care than efficiency, optimization, and repetition? And there's really a deep need for this now, right? Because these machines that were once just locked away into a factory are now all over our sidewalks, our cities and our skies. They are here living in the wild with us. And uh, these things need to do more than just fulfill a task, right? They need to enhance our lives. They need to um, be things that begin to augment the human condition. And so for that, what we need are artists and designers to come in and make these things more relevant. So I focus a lot with industrial robots. I think they're absolutely amazing machines. They're, they're these things that people describe superpowers with, right? They have superhuman speed, superhuman uh, repetition, superhuman strength, it, all these things that, that are kind of just like locked away inside a factory doing really, really boring tasks over and over again. So the work that I do fundamentally tries to convince these machines to, to do things that were, they were never really designed to do. So take a machine designed to move in the world, uh, connect it with some sensors that can see in the world and see what happens. And so this is a, one of the first major projects I did with an industrial robot um, that is really thinking about how to get these things to respond to us. You know, these, these things, are, they're, they're giant beasts of machines that weighs a ton. And uh, for me, I wanted to be able to have this machine follow me around the lab keep me company as if it were an excited puppy. Uh, and in my art practice, that's fundamentally what I do is I, I create software tools to convince machines to do things they were never designed to do. So take something that was made for short repetitive tasks and maybe get open to improvisation, make it open to newness, make it open to respond and to react to the things around it. And what I learned along the way is that by making this machine move and have a presence in space, it actually had a, a presence and impact on my experience of that space in return. And that led to, to quite a bit of work and invitations to sort of translate this experience for other people's in, in dynamic spaces. So taking something out of a lab where there's one person with one robot and translating that experience for a whole crowd. So this was at the Design Museum in London a couple of years back. And um, here, what 
we had to do a little bit of engineering to bring this robot to life. So this is Nemus here, and she normally works on a factory line in Birmingham in the UK. And we decided to give her a six month holiday to just go into the museum and live and exist and, and not do anything but enjoy herself and greet visitors and, and hang out with people and just be curious for the people around her. Uh, the work that I do oftentimes, uh, because we're, we're doing things that existing software tools don't allow you to do, we have to make the software, we might have to modify the hardware to bring these things to life. And so that, that literacy that, that, that's taken a long time to build up is something quite fundamental to, to getting things to do things that were never intended to do. So here you see some of the software that, that I've developed and, and used. Um, and we, we love open source tools for the most part. We use open frameworks a lot. So this is Mimas alive in the museum. And uh, it was a really wonderful experience. It also very, you know, having having worked side by side with the machine for, for weeks to get this ready and then to have it sort of sent off onto another continent and, and you hope you know, you hope it does well, you hope people like it, you hope um, it, it, it's, it's having a good time over another continent. It kind of felt like sending a child off to, off to school for the first time. Um, but it was really a wonderful experience for me to be able to share these things that people usually see through media news about uh, robots replacing labor. People might see them in factory lines to take a completely out of that context and to bring it in front of hundreds of thousands of people um, through a museum exhibition was really a nice way to sort of give a, a new generation of people a higher expectation of what these machines can do for us. Um, so this project was, was one robot with a crowd of people and I was fortunate enough to have a, an invite to explore the future of Industry 4.0 for the World Economic Forum. And here, what I really wanted to do was to explore what it's like when we're surrounded by robots, so many robots around one person, and how the intelligence around that machine and the experience of this, this pack, this horde of robots can really uh, play into, into the emotional connection with the people around us. So uh, try to be really thoughtful about how this, the, the robots and the staging have a physical presence. And, and in the end, the material that I'm working with is space. There's, there's machines here, but it's really the spatial relationships that drive these connections and these emotions, emotional responses from, from the crowd. So this is an assembly line of robots on a bed of light. And peeling back the brains a little bit, they each have 10 controllers, but they're controlled by one central brain. And that's a fundamental affordance that as people, we, it's, it's hard to wrap our head around that one robot can have a presence and understanding of what everything around it, the other machines and its pack, the whole space, you know, its, its organs are separated from, from its body. Um, and so that was one of the, the main things we were focusing on communicating in this industry 4.0, kind of this, this future of work potential. Um, Again, this is a really wonderful opportunity to, to go to a different culture, that a different culture with different body language uh, than what I'm used to, and to see these machines come to life and, and connect with folks. And the original instinct is always to control these machines. And, and as soon as they do something unexpected, as soon as they give you a little head turn, um, the, the relationship shifts from connection, from control to connection oftentimes. Uh, the spaces that I've worked in, I've been very, really, really, really lucky. I, I actually met Sugan and Maria through this space here. Uh, this is Pier 9. So the, the big orange robot was actually here. And to do this, I was actually living in Toronto. I had to move from Toronto to San Francisco in order to go do this. And then the project in the Design Museum, uh, I had to go to the robot again to do this project. And I went to Boston, an amazing Autodesk space, amazing, amazing facility space. But again, I had to I had to move from Pittsburgh and move my team to Boston in order to pull this off. And so when this opportunity arose to do this thing for in China, I was determined to, to do it in Pittsburgh and not have the, to move and have the resources come to me. And so this was the space that I did that project out of. And so we had two robots in Pittsburgh. This is our high-tech calibration object. 
we had two spaces in in uh, two robots in Pittsburgh and did everything in simulation, hoping that it, it would work on ten robots when we got to to China to set up. Um, so obviously you can see that this is quite cramped. And, and so the next stage was really to find the proper space. And so for the past year and a half, uh, we've been renovating a 10,000 square foot warehouse into a live workspace in Pittsburgh. And uh, now I'm, I'm like feeling like an architect again, finally, right? Not just playing with robots, I'm actually designing space again. Uh, but but fair warning, it, it's really horrible when you're your own client. It's like the worst feeling ever. Um, but the goal here really is to is to think about you know not just visit these robots in an office or in a studio from nine to five, but really to begin to think about what it's like to cohabitate with them. So moving from automation to collaboration to actually cohabitation, and so the space that we live together in. It is is just incredibly important to to at least where my creativity comes from or what I try to do. Um, let's see my head here. And so these are just some of the shots. So we we finished a we finished a project about four months ago and and, and uh, moved in. Um, and around the same time, we also had another project where this this little girl Lena came out, and so she moved in with the robots and us into the into the warehouse. We had to like scratch out a workshop CNC room and put like nursery uh, on the blueprints uh, pretty early on in the design phase. And uh, it's a pretty incredible space, right? It's like a, a winter proof playground for her. And you know, in in learning how to to become a parent, and be, this is my first time being a caretaker of anything, even like plants. You know, uh, it helped me think about ways of of engaging with with my robot too, and thinking that you know my robot should have really interesting experiences. You know, are there ways to for my my robot to feel outside of its its own body? Does it really have to be limited to its own space here? Uh, so what I like about this is, is, you know, this thing for the first time in my profession, I had control over the space. I had control over the machine. And so if I wanted to hang a robot upside down from a swing, uh, there was no one saying that I couldn't. Um, and as a really interesting byproduct, you know, having, having a child during a pandemic where she really couldn't have a lot of social interaction, it was really nice for her, her to have a bit of companionship in, in the warehouse where we, we set their swings up together. So uh, I'm, I'm so excited to, to continue the conversation. Uh, I'm so excited to, to see what everyone's up, been up to. And, and Maria, I think you should, should take it over. Thank you so much, Madeline, um, and Sugwen for amazing presentations. Um, it's so nice to see both of your work. Um, I'm going to invite you to turn your cameras and if you want microphones on, and we can officially transition to the discussion part um, of our lovely event. For those of you who are attending as an attendee, um, please feel free to throw questions into the Q&A. I will ask you to do that in the Q&A and not in the chat, just because then I'll see them all the time and I won't lose track of the questions. Um, but in the meantime, I have questions. Uh, and since I have the privilege to go first, I am going to use it. Um, so obviously, I think as the audience may or may not have already noticed, there's a lot of overlap in both of your work. Um, and something that I've been thinking around a lot is this, um, the, the, that's something that you both touched upon, but this context in which we are potentially used to think about robots, the different narratives that are constructed for us, uh, specifically the narrative of automation, the narrative of the factory and like this repeatable, you know, extremely precise, very powerful machine that does things over and over and over again. So I wanted to ask you about this kind of gesture of taking the machine out of its context. And Madeline, I really appreciate how you talk about it almost as a vac vacation for your welding robot. Um, like, is that gesture of taking it out and using it for something 
that is not evaluated based on optimization, that is not evaluated based on, I don't know, speed and quality of product, but, but is evaluated in a very different way um, as an artistic gesture. Is that a rebellion of a sort against this kind of automated manufacturing repetitive um, mode of kind of thinking about, you know, how we as humans occupy the world? Or is it more of an alternative traje trajectory, alternative future? And kind of where do you see that moving forward outside of maybe your own practices? Um, I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll start on that just because Madeline just finished talking. I'll give her a little bit of a break. But uh, I, um, I think it's interesting because I think depending on the day, depending on how like aggressive I'm feeling that day or how just disgruntled I feel about the world. Um, it's either like a um, kind of ulterior path or it's just a firm disruption. But I do think there's something about taking this icon of the industrial revolution and sort of turning it on its head, something that is about control into something about companionship or control and collaboration. And I think for me, one of the um, aspects of automation um, that uh, in some ways, and, and automation as as extension that doesn't get maybe addressed as much is the um, level of entropy <laughs> as, that happens with the the skill when it is extended through these um, machines. And I think in the work um, with the units um, and with Doug, uh, I'm trying to think a little bit more about relation and what those. Um, what those interaction models, what those relational um, intelligences um, that can be built uh, can be with embodiment at the center. Uh, and um, I think that's been a really um, um, uh, incendiary, but uh, a really interesting um, uh, sort of brief for me, like thinking not about extension automation, but um, ways to really implicate um, my own practice in it and, and how that feels. So. Um, I've been, uh, I think when anything gets too precise or controllable or um, I, I, I find that for me, that's usually the wrong direction for my practice. And um, there's something exciting about going beyond that um, in whatever way I can. Yeah, for me, it, um, you know, when you think about a robot, especially an industrial robot, it, it's really a symbol for everything that we fear about technology, which I think at its heart is the fear of our own obsolescence. I think that's kind of what drives a, a, a lot of this. And, um, you know, people often think that, that the future is like a force of nature. It's like physics, it's something that's coming at us and it's not something that's guidable for us. And so I think for me, when I try to take something out of its normal context and put it into an unfamiliar setting, a lot of times is I, I want the experience or the machine itself to be a mirror for us to begin to investigate what vestiges of our past we want to carry on into our future, right? So like the, the let's take like the, the robot in the museum behind glass, you know, it, it has a lot of familiar um, uh, experience of visiting something at the zoo. And because it's a robot, and not an animal, it provides like space to think about like, should we have robots as zoo creatures? Do we cage these things? Are we treating animals correctly by doing this? Um, and and just the fact that that it's it's a an odd thing but a familiar feeling, I think, can help us rattle and, and, and again do like these gut checks for what the future we actually want to be, right? It's, it's easy, it's easy. We all know the future that we don't want. It's a lot harder to begin to decide, discern and imagine the future that we actually do want, let alone get there. That is such a great point. Thank you, Madeline. Um, I do follow up on the, um, like this process of thinking about, um, you know, a piece of robotic work that, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm being a little bit cheeky here saying optimizing for empathy almost, right? Optimizing for companionship. Um, 
And something that I always think about when I see both of your work is that you're of course, like you're always there in the final result, be that a video or a performance, but also of course you are there behind the scenes. You are, you know, coding and creating the choreography, creating the behaviors. And I was wondering at that phase of the work, um, is there a moment where you noticeably kind of switch from almost like the role of the puppeteer into the role of the collaborator? And is that something that happens gradually? Is that something that happens at all? Um, and like, what does that look like? I think the connection runs a lot deeper, right? Because, uh, you know, my personality is ingrained in the code itself. Like these little obnoxious robots, like chirping at you, trying to get your attention. like. That's like the most American experience. Like that's that's me. That's that's <laughs> my like that's my that's my personality sort of emerging out of out of these machines. So um, I I sort of but there are these moments in the whole process where it's like okay I'm gonna put on my like engineer hat and do some problem solving and then I'm gonna step back and like become the Jane Goodall of robotics and just observe how these things I are love operating so in the much. wild. <laughs> And then what, 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 like, what like Jane can't do is she can't like go back in and tinker in their brains. But, but like there, there is that, that part of it. But, but I don't think that, and, and I, I imagine, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that, that your robots have, have personality traits that, that you share. They have sensibilities that you share with them as well. And it's much deeper than, than just, you know, puppeteering. It's, it's a, a part of oh. your, your DNA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, on, I was going to answer quite differently, but not, but I, with, with the same thread of what you're saying, and that is such a near, like the data is mine, that sometimes the, the depending, sometimes the biofeedback is mine. So it's, but I think my state of um, uh, uh, freedom when I'm working with um, the, the project is really different once I pay, uh, pick up a paintbrush. Because then it's just full on physical embodied like relational gesture, which is so different for me than coding um, and debugging. Like there's, there's, I'm very present in that. But I think with painting, it's a little bit of a, a fugue state for me, um, for better or for worse. Um, but in that way, I was thinking about um, again uh, as you're talking a little bit of the similarities between um, Madeline and my work beyond uh, this idea that we're, we're both physically interacting with the robots. I think um, it's, it's that we're both really embracing indeterminacy in the interaction, right? There's no um, like um, uh, input that completes the loop when I'm drawing. It's about play and creation. And I think so much of what I've seen of Madeline's work is that there's nothing that tells you when you're done it's not like you have to go to the finish line. And I love, I think that indeterminacy feels so much more like what life is about <laughs> than when robots are implemented in a, a more um, sort of assembly line type of um, uh, construct. There is a there is a completion. It's meant there's a beginning and an end. And I love this gray area that, that we occupy in that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I wish that coding felt like play for me and I wish I could sort of disassociate in the same way um, as when I paint that would be maybe I that maybe one day <laughs> I really feel you on that um, right. <laughs> somewhat building up on that uh, there's this great question from Phoebe in chat um, which kind of maybe moves forward into this um, like how does one feel when working with different types of machines and I would maybe even expand it a little bit further into like embodied machines and not embodied machines but the the question is um, how the physical form or physicality of the robot or different types of robots like mobile or industrial arm or small or large affects your interaction with it how it interacts with the work or how it might express the same kinds of inputs differently because the body is different um, and again I'm just going to add to that what if the robot is not embodied like what if it's a piece that is just on the screen and how does that feel differently mm -hmm. yeah i mean for, you know i i built software tools and they can run on 
lots of robots, like any ABB robot. And you can't really transfer what, what was built for the big giant robot onto these little svelte robots because the, the body that you have has a personality. Um, the motors, they can move at different rates. They sound different. One of the things we couldn't really share over the Zoom is just the sound of these things. The, the big robot roars and these little robots chirp at you. And all of that, you know, like you, you can think about this for like a big person and a small person, a fat person and a skinny person, like right? the body language you have so is so ingrained in us, it's in our, in our you know, primal brains to, to read this and be making judgments about it and to be understanding it, that we can't turn it off. And so even if we're working on the same type of robot, but at different scales, you can't help but in, in see different personalities onto these machines. Yeah, that's such a great point. There's something about the materiality at scale and even the materiality at like number of, of robots. I think for me, when I worked with generation three, <coughs> I built a, a 20, um, a 20 multi-robotic system, um, which was a different format than I was used to instead of um, sort of reimagining the purpose of a, a industrial robotic arm um, a design, uh, we uh, built 20 uh, smaller wheel-based robots. And I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be, this is, I, I built one prototype. I can easily scale that up to 20, no, no problem. And we realized even like getting um, the right type of lithium battery charged uh, for each of these units or it was, um, and Maria knows a thing or two about this too. And uh, Maria, you're like nodding furiously. Uh -huh. it, it, why, why did we not talk before that? Batteries. It was a total, to it, was, it, was, it was so much more complex. And the, the, and I think bringing that into the space of the canvas um, felt really vital, but very, um, uh, just so, so like honest about the, the phase of production we we're in and really, not um, trying to sweep that um, uh, under the rug, but uh, on the topic of um, sort of uh, how these systems uh, are deployed in, in the physical world versus the simulation, um, even the paint, the slippage of the wheels on paint um, really messed my uh, uh, local and global uh, tracking system up beyond measure. And it's just things like that you'd never think of like uh, without actually building it and being physically surrounded um, by um, 20 units. And it was uh, it was a really interesting learning experience, but um, something that, um, yeah, made me want to go back to robotic, industrial robotic arms, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Super, like, like you could imagine oh like God. the trouble that curators have to find a CRT television for like a Nam Jupak. <laughs> artwork and they're gonna like you know in in 50 years they're gonna try and keep your swarm of, of 20 robots alive and working um, on exhibit. Um, oh man I want to I actually want to revisit that whole project with the level of knowledge I have now and just make a really bulletproof like really like archival version of it because right now it's it's like, it, I feel like it's a robot safari. It's, um, it's really, it, it's really uncount, but in a lovely way too. So. Yeah, that, that sounds so familiar. And I feel like I have yeah, that yeah. thought after every single project and then I move on to another <laughs> project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that is so awesome to hear. Um, there's another question in the chat, in the Q and A. Um, which again, I think builds on the types of machines and goes into the question of uncanny valley. And do you think that companionship is possible because you can alienate yourself from the multi-axis robot? And I'm assuming that what Chris means is that there's no, uh, yes, the robot moves, yes, the motion feels like it is alive, but it doesn't necessarily look human. Um, like, would you imagine something that is similar with an Android? Yeah, I definitely just completely sidestep Uncanny Valley. So what happens with the Uncanny Valley, when something looks almost human, you see this a lot in like CG art, for example, looks almost human. All you start to see are the ways it's not human versus like you can look at electrical outlet and see a face in it. You can look at a cloud and see a bunny rabbit in it. So there's, there's this, you know, in my work, 
I use animalistic behaviors as a way to tap into, again, like our, our primordial brain to, to send communication on, on frequencies that our brain can't turn off. Um, and, and that's just like, it's a little, that's like a cheat code. It's like, it's awesome. It's so cool because it's so predictable. Humans are so predictable, right? Um, but, you know, uh, oftentimes I don't really see the point of, of bipeds and robots. We have, we have people, people are great. Why do I want a robot that can do only what a person can do? I want a robot that can climb walls. I want a swarm of robots that can draw forever. I want machines that can fly. I want machines that can carry heavy things. I mean, that, that's what I, I much prefer. I, I think also the challenging part of robotics, people want to be servants. People want them to do caretaking jobs. And um, it's a huge industry thread in robotics into health, how to be get robots into oh I think I lost my internet connection. I'm gonna stop. I'm I think am I back? Sorry about that. I think you're back. I think you're back. You know what? I'll just end that rant there and hand it off to someone with better internet connection. <laughs> I really like the rant, though. I'm, and, and <laughs> I think that the, the uh, Jane Goodall of uh, robots is gonna live in my memory forever. I, I keep on thinking that. Um, <laughs> no, I think the you know I think there's some um, like Geminoid Uncanny Valley esque robots that um, I I I I think just as a complete personal opinion, hot take. I find like Madeline said, um, the details of how um, puppet like it is. Um, very disconcerting and I I can't like help but dissect the the like the stylistic decisions that inform the presentation of the robot that the sexism often... I think so was going with the sexism oh. around it. <laughs> right okay. yeah 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 <laughs> mostly that mostly that uh yeah like the white prairie dress uh that some of these robotic units wear for me that's not the the field um that I'm interested in. And I don't think that, I don't know what good that does in the world, but I think um, from my interest in, uh, you know, I, I, I loved uh, Madeline, what you said about being in the pandemic and um, um, sort of creating this relation uh, with, your, with your new child, with the robotic unit as sort of a way of, um, you know, adapting to the circumstances of um, isolation, right? And uh, and I actually this um, I know I'm glitching out a lot with my uh, with my top knot here, but um, I spent a year in Basel uh, doing an artist residency, uh, which uh, in which I had to quarantine quite often. So I was actually not allowed to see other human beings for um, we weeks at a time, and I would just paint with the robotic unit. So my my um, practice of um, constructing narratives around this collaboration and companionship maybe became incredibly um, lived in <laughs> because for many weeks, uh, the robotic unit um, was, you know, was a companion in, in a lot of ways and ways that I wasn't really anticipating. So I think there's a lot of room to explore um, that kind of mirroring and that kind of companionship that's not human companionship, but something else that I think um, is really hardwired into being um, human um, in a in a way, um, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that answered a, a question of sorts. Yeah, no, I think that is a great answer, and I totally agree. I I feel like I operate in a similar way, away from anything barely human looking. It's like let's make robots in different shapes and sizes and types and then make friendships with those, because that sounds more fun. Um, another question from the Q&A, um, question from Philip, how does the creative process of imagining new relations between tech and humans look like to you in your work? Uh, and I'm, again, going to selfishly restructure it a bit. How do you, um, when you embark on a project, like how does the project start, um, you know, how does one develop uh, a finished piece or a, unfinished piece? Um, I think 
for for me anyway, um, it really comes, and I think it's a maybe similar in some of Madeline's work too. It really comes from two sort of things. I'm um, yeah, I figured her internet would want to uh, re re. Um, there we go. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think for me it comes from my lived experience and what I'm interested in really uh, during the. Um, the pandemic really got interested in biofeedback and meditation um, as an input, and then thinking about ways in which um, new technologies are uh, maybe changing those types of relations and sensibilities for for humans, um, and then maybe integrating that into into the practice. Um, but yeah, it, it ends up being really organic. But I think so so much of this work is really inspired by um challenging narratives that we're um told about engaging with these newer systems that we already know um are quite disruptive at scale <laughs> and um or if not disruptive then very powerful at scale so um if those if both are true then what does that mean for um in the focused microcosm of an art practice and and also um what new um you know ways can we Im imagine it and, and demarcate that and um and challenge that for ourselves um especially prevalent in like narratives about ai narratives about computer vision um and just and i think there's a real value in um sort of you know going beyond socio-technical knowledge and actually getting one's hands dirty in the material of the work and then sharing that and that becomes sort of a an uh, object for um, discussion and interpretation that is is what I like to say very non-speculative um, because mm -hmm. it works with the raw material of the day and I think that's been really important um, to me uh, over the past few years. Awesome, thank you, uh, Madeline. How how are you doing on the internet side? Before I cool, what's happening? <laughs> I think there's a audio switch. Um, in the oh, there we go. Can you hear us now? Maybe, maybe not. I'm gonna so go and ask you another question in the meantime. Um, oh, yeah. I've been super curious about your recent work with AR, um, kind of from you know the glimpses that I've seen on Instagram and social media. I'm very curious how that kind of branches off or maybe feeds into um, your work with embodied machines um, and whether um, these objects are machines to you. That's a, you know, I'm still trying to reconcile those two directions um, actually, because I think so much about the work with the robotic units and the work <coughs> with these AR sculptures are about exploring new freedoms in drawing, which is something I feel very home at home in and very safe in. Um, and I think they've taken on these sculptural qualities in AR and they've taken on this sort of embodied relation in the robotic work. But I'm really interested to use um, sort of this, this layer of AR to visualize more um, sort of what the robot sees and what data is actually being passed through because right now I know because I'm I'm the robot wizard in some way but like I'd love to be able to share that in in um, real time to actually enhance the, the spatial feeling of the performances or really um, bring that uh, layer especially with the biofeedback there's so much about um, how I'm connecting the two that I think gets lost in just a, a video presentation of it so um, and I guess at the moment, because I'm so tactile with the robotic units, I don't see the air works as robots per se, but um, but that might change uh, depending on um, how interactive I allow them to be um, in the future. Uh, but but yeah, really, really interested in, in integrating the two right now. Um, so um, watch this space or something. <laughs> this is so exciting. <laughs> that. Thank you for giving us a little uh, glimpse into that. Um, hey, gang, I think I'm back. Hi. Welcome Zoom back. didn't like any of my headphones. So I'm just going <laughs> to aggressively hit the mute button over and over and hope for no feedback. It sounds great to me. Um, so 
I hope it sounds great to all of our attendees as well. I wanted to revisit the quite the, the previous question um, about the kind of how does one embark on the project? Um, you know, how do you get into that space where you're like, I'm gonna have 10 robots and this is what I'm going to do. And this is, I don't know, the first um, prototype, the second prototype, et cetera. Yeah, I think, well, the 10 robots is a funny story. I asked for ABV for 10 robots because I thought it was an absurd number and they said, yes. And I'm like, oh man, I should have asked for 50. Like I obviously didn't ask for enough if they said yes on the first time. I love but, your um, problems, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> right? They were, they were on loan, they were on loan. Um, but, uh, but usually, so for all of the work that I showed, except for the last little bit, I really start with the technical curiosity, right? So I usually start with something that that's like, okay, um, what's what's this what's this assumption that we have about this technology that that people are just looking at it in the wrong direction, right? How can we find an interesting thing for this old tech technique? Um, and that's that's been like a lot of so a lot of it uh, of my work tries us to like tease out the poetry in the pragmatic. And I think it was conditioned a lot because a lot of that was was um, during my PhD. Like when you do a PhD, it has to fit in a certain box in order to, to check off, do the checklist and get that sheet of paper. Um, and since finishing that, I've been trying, and, and I think it's like, I, Sue and I look to you as a role model for this. I've been trying to come at it from a more personal, point of view, from a more um, emotional point of view, from a more, um, to just like stop fetishizing the tech behind it and really think about it, it, it as it relates to, to me. And that's something that's, that's very foreign to me. It's very uncomfortable. And I don't think I'm particularly good at it yet. Um, it, it's a new way of practicing. It's a new way of looking at it. Um, but it's something that I hope to, to get better at as time goes on. Um, I think uh, I really appreciate you uh, saying that. I think seeing the uh, recent work with the studio and actually bringing the robot into your your home and your sort of your lived environment is a really um, that's that's once I started doing that and sort of taking the robot away from this idea of it as a work project and and just having it in my periphery, like it really. It, really inspired a lot of new directions um, and really helped um, me integrate that. Cause I, I absolutely know what you mean. It's, um, I feel like they're very, they're two modes of um, ideation and, um, and creativity. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to uh, see, see the robot. Um, we, we should bring our robots on a play date at some point. I travel with mine, so. So oh, I found <laughs> a power supply, a battery, a UPS, an interruptible power supply. And with, I, with with Addy Wagonek, we took the UR10 into the park. Um, uh, oh, cool! Nice. So yes, Amazing. I have I have the infrastructure set up for that. I got a little red wagon too. We can move them all. <laughs> and Incredible! Go. We'll find a sunny day. It'll be perfect. <laughs> I'm gonna crash that uh, play date with my tiny machines that will crawl over your machines, and then the image will be complete. Um, well, on, unfortunately, on this lovely, um, yes, I think everyone is invited. Um, on this lovely note, I'm going to have to wrap this um, amazing conversation. And sorry, I'm going to grab a document that will tell me what I'm supposed to say. Um, but thank you both so much. This has been such a pleasure to um, hear and see your work. Um, to have a bit of an insight into what you're working on right now and what you're planning. Um, as usual, a huge pleasure to talk to both of you. Um, and I hope at some point we'll get to do this again, but not in a digital space, but rather in person. Maybe we should just schedule a big robot play date at Daniel's. Um, so Thank you also so much to our audience. I am going to remind you all to um, make sure that you keep an eye on the Daniels Faculty Fall 2021 public program. And the next event in the program is titled Shared Space, Shared Vision, Shared Power. 
Advancing Racial Justice in American Cities with Stephen Gray. And it's coming up next Monday on October 25th at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Um, otherwise, we hope to see you all online very, very soon. Have a lovely evening or night or afternoon, depending on where you are logging in from. And thank you again so much to our lovely speakers and hope to see you soon. Thanks all. Thank you. Goodbye.